We'll start out with the fact that this is a talk on Inside the Enigma, Fialca, and M209, and we're going to disassemble them um, on the screen primarily because my hands are pretty shaky these days, but um, we'll be able to look inside each of these machines uh, which we have in front of us here. So let me start out um, by doing the Enigma disassembly. We're going to go from the Enigma that you see on the left to the Enigma in its modular components. Then I'm going to take the Fialca, which you see on the left in that slide, and disassemble it into its modular components. And then I'm going to take the M209, the American code machine, which you see here and on the left in that slide. And I'm not going to take it apart because it's <laughs> really complicated to get it back together again when your hands shake. So uh, we'll have to look inside and pretend we're taking it apart. We'll start out by disassembling the Enigma machine. And uh, the Enigma machine is a code machine that was used by all branches of the German military from way before the war, back in 1928, all the way to the end of the war in 1945. There were 20 to 30,000 Enigma machines made, and at the end of the war, those which hadn't been destroyed in the war were ordered to be destroyed by Hitler. And therefore, very, very few Enigma machines remain. In fact, there are only 281 remaining intact Enigma machines out of the 20, 30,000 that were made before the war. And they've gradually increased in price as people realize their historic importance. And uh, I think I bought my first one for about $6,000. I sold it at Dayton for $18,000. And they're now selling for a third of a million dollars, $330,000. So it's about the same cost as a Rolls Royce, and I think I'd rather have a Rolls Royce to drive around in all honesty, but some people want to have a coffee table ornament, a little third of a million dollar coffee table ornament, and I managed to sell about two of these a year. I have a team of about 10 people in Europe who are always hunting for enigmas for me. This particular machine was in the basement of a house, and the house caught fire, and luckily, the firemen got there before the fire totaled the house, and they filled the basement with water, and then the burning house collapsed on top of the basement. And this poor little Enigma machine was sitting in the bottom, and the water protected it from the heat, and somehow it managed not to get crushed. So all we had to do, one of my guys found it over there. Anytime they find an Enigma for me, I give them a $10,000 bonus. They're very happy. <laughs> And uh, there they were. They found this thing. And all we had to do was take it apart and clean it and uh, replace some of the wiring in it in order to get it to work. All the machines that I sell are working machines. So uh, I've learned to do a lot of work on them. There's a part that's broken. I have a guy in Germany who dug up the factory where Enigma machines were built. It was bombed, so it was a bomb crater. And down the bottom of the bomb crater, he found a lot of original Enigma parts that had never been put in an Enigma. And so he was uh, able to supply those to us, and we can fix Enigma machines then with original parts. Again, stop me if you have any question. Let's start out with a little uh, information about how the Enigma works. It's basically just like a Dick Tracy code ring, uh, code uh, wheel, and uh, that's also the device that was used during the Civil War. This is a Confederate States of America code wheel, and if you consider the outer ring around the code wheel to be the plain text, the letter A, for instance, uh, the wheel is capable of providing a enciphered letter uh, that matches that plain text. So if you trying to hide the letter A, you put it into this code wheel and it comes out the cipher text letter H. And H is the secret coded letter for A. And if another general or person in the Civil War has a code wheel like this, and if they know the day's key, and the day's key is the critical thing, A equals H. A is a cross from H. 
then any plain, any coded letters that they get on the inside wheel, they can decode into a plain text letter on the outside wheel. And that's all that a code wheel does, and that's all that an Enigma does, except the one thing is that an Enigma machine changes the inner circular dial every time you type in a letter. Whereas in the Civil War, you could pretty easily guess it's only 26 possible coded versions of the letter. Um, at, with an Enigma machine, changing that central wheel uh, gives you 10 to the 114th power possible uh, days keys. And we'll explain that a little bit. But it is basically, uh, there are only 10 to the 80th power atoms in the entire observable universe. So 10 to the 114th power is many more than all the atoms that you can imagine in the universe. And that's the number of days keys that you need to know in order to decipher a message on the Enigma. So you take an Enigma machine and you type in the letter A, just like we did on the code wheel there, and you just press the key on the Enigma machine and you watch the little light bulb or a panel on the Enigma machine to see which letter lights up. And in this case, in this example, when we type the letter A, the cipher text H lights up, showing that H is the coded version of the letter A. And we'll go through the circuit diagram of how that works. It's a very simple diagram. Um, we see uh, a key switch up in the upper part here, and we're going to push that switch and we're going to see the circuit that ends up lighting up the light bulb H. So we press that switch, and the electricity from the battery that you see there flows into a plugboard panel on the front of the Enigma machine, which changes the wiring of the letter A over to letter wiring for letter O. And then the O is carried through a wire into a set of three rotors and it goes through those three rotors and those are these three wheels that you see in the enigma machine goes through those rotors and they're not turning they're just sitting there for this particular encoded message and it gets to the end of those rotors and it ends up at something called the reflector over there on the left and all that does is send the electricity back through the, the rotors and back out to the light to the um, plugboard panel again on the front, and that plugboard panel jumpers over the letter that comes out of those rotors, which is M, to the letter H, and then the letter H simply goes out to the H light bulb and lights up the H light bulb. So basically, an Enigma machine is nothing more than a flashlight. We have a battery, a switch, and a light bulb. A little more complicated in terms of its wiring, but not all that much complicated. There are only 80 wires in an entire Enigma machine, so it's pretty simple. That's good for me because I fix a lot of them, and it's not too hard to troubleshoot the darn thing. Okay, so if you then take that H, which is the secret coded version of the letter A, and you type it into another Enigma machine, that has been set to the same starting key. Remember the starting key for a code wheel was A equals A? Well, the Enigma starting key is a little more complicated, as we'll see. But if you type that letter H into a different Enigma that's set to the same starting key, the light bulb for the letter A will light up. So you've now encoded the letter A as H on one Enigma, You've taken that H over, either sent it by Morse code or telephone or messenger to another enigma, and you now decode the information on the other enigma back into the letter A. Very straightforward. Here's the circuit. You notice we're now going to push the H key, and the battery is going to provide the voltage. Voltage is going to go through the rotor stack and back through the rotor stack and back through the plug board and it's going to light up the letter A. So again, you can't get a much simpler circuit than that, a battery, a switch, and a light bulb. And basically, an enigma is just 26 of those because there are 26 letters in the alphabet. Now, the neat thing about the enigma is the next time you type in 
the letter A on the keyboard, the rotor turns. You typed it in once, you got an, a, an H, and the second time you type it in, the rotor, the leftmost rotor turns one step. You can see it maybe turn here. I haven't got it locked in. The leftmost rotor turns one step, and it changes the light bulb that lights up, and that becomes an X. So if you keep pressing A over and over again, you keep getting different letters. With a code wheel, every time you take an A, you always get an H. So the Enigma is a good bit more complicated. Here's the total wiring diagram of the Enigma. Again, pretty straightforward. We see the battery is right here. And if you watch what happens when you press the letter A button on the keyboard down there, the battery uh, a switch is closed and the battery supplies a voltage. The voltage comes down through the plug board on the front, goes up into the rotor stack, through the rotor stack, back through the rotor stack, back through the plug board, and it lights up the letter H. So again, very straightforward. And one more diagram to show you how the Enigma works. Just so you're familiar with the overall process, this one shows the keyboard here and the fact that the keyboard provides 26 possible wires into the plug board. The plug board provides 26 wires into the rotor stack, and then the rotor provides one of 26 letters coming back out, goes through the plug board again, goes through the keyboard, normally closed contact, and lights up the light bulb panel. Um, that diagram is a little useful because we're going to compare that diagram of the Enigma machine with the diagram of the Russian Fialka machine. So let's take apart an Enigma machine and look at what's inside. And I'm just going to run you through the disassembly. We end up with a set of modular components. One of the nice things about the Enigma is that the components, the major components, uh, are modular and can be swung out and repaired. The unfortunate thing about the Enigma is that the modular components can't be plugged in. They are hardwired into the machine, so you've basically got to fix it um, uh, with it fully wired. You can't just replace a keyboard or replace a plug board, um, and that is a major drawback. But I've talked to a number of Enigma repairmen from World War II, and they said, we never had any problems with it. The only problems we ever had was occasionally the rotors would get a little dirty, and we'd have to clean them. So apparently the wiring that connects, for instance, the main mechanism to the plug board or the main mechanism to the keyboard or the light bulb panel is very, very reliable. And that's pretty much what I've found in all the Enigmas that I've serviced. So I'm going to run through the Enigma disassembly in sort of a time-lapse technique and uh, talk you through it. We start out with the wooden box on the outside, and the wooden box sometimes has a serial number on the end, which is helpful. We try and keep track of all the serial numbers of the Enigmas. And we turn the wooden box around, and we open the top of the box, and we see what you see in front of you here. And then we open the panel on the front, this wooden panel, very, very important panel, because what it does is it applies pressure to all the plugs in the plug board assembly there. And you've got to have it snugly closed. So here it's open. What you have to do is close it like that, snugly, and then latch it in order for the machine to work reliably. If you don't have these things plugged in and forced in appropriately, they won't work very well. So that's the first thing you do. Then you open the top cover. I just did that for you here. And the next thing we're going to look at is the uh, battery box. So the battery box is right there. Just watch as we open up the battery box. And no battery box in this one. Um, as a matter of fact, there are no original Enigma batteries that have survived. So I generally use flashlight batteries. You only need three volts to make the thing work. And the next thing we're going to do is to remove the rotors. And there are the three rotors. In order to remove the rotors, you have to move the reflector on the left to the left. And then you can just lift these three rotors out on their shaft, and you can then lay them on the table. 
Next thing we're going to do is take the enigma out of the box, out of the wooden box. And we need to rest it on a pillow in order to do this. And we use a screwdriver to unscrew the four screws. And then we lift off the wooden box from the enigma. And we now have an unboxed enigma. Stop me if you have any questions. And there's the enigma. We're going to turn it back up. <laughs> and in the process of making this thing, I sort of ended up bumping the box a few times, but it ended up OK. So now we have the Enigma, and we're going to focus on taking apart the Enigma machine itself. And uh, we have to take the screws out of the side of it. There are a total of five screws on each side. You can see them being unscrewed here. And then there are a number of screws on the back. And the Enigma machine is then slid out of its case. So the metal cover with the both sides and the back can be removed from the Enigma, and that gives you the entire mechanism exposed like that. Once we have the mechanism exposed, the next step is to take off the plug board on the front. And we do that by unscrewing the screws and swinging it out using the cabling sort of as a hinge, being very careful as we do it. And we then unscrew one side of the light bulb panel. That's what I'm doing there. And take another look at the plug board. There's a little cover over the back of the plug board. By the way, the people who built Enigma machines were Jewish prisoners of war. Can you believe it? The Germans forced Jewish prisoners of war to build their Enigma machines. So of course, they tried to sabotage the machine. And one of the really fun things for me is looking inside Enigma machines and finding what types of sabotage these guys did on the machine. They couldn't just make the machine not work or they would have been shot if they're building the machine. So what they had to do was do a time delay sabotage, which means the machine had to pass its inspection and then fail in the field. And how do you do that? Well, there are lots of interesting techniques that they use, but I thought the best one was I found a fish hook in the wiring here of the plug board. Just looked like an innocent, accidentally dropped fish hook. But the point of the fish hook had worked its way through the insulation of the wiring and shorted out the Enigma machine. So they got their way. They made the machine not function. Another technique that they used was to take one of these plugs that you see on the cables here that hadn't been attached to a cable and just leave it loose inside the Enigma. And if it's banging around inside the Enigma and it gets under that bar there, it prevents the bar from coming all the way down, making contact, and makes the machine absolutely not function. So that was another technique. And there were lots of other ones. Another neat one was they used screws that were about a millimeter too long. So they bottomed out, and they didn't pinch the wire very effectively. And so the wires became loose and intermittent, and the machine failed. Uh, fascinating to look inside enigmas like looking in a time capsule. Anyway, we take the cover off that. And now we go over and unscrew the light bulb panel. and pull the light bulb panel away. And as you can see, when these are exposed, you can work on the wiring. You can resolder any bad connections. Now we're going to take the keyboard off. And there are four screws that hold the keyboard mechanism in place in the front there. And the keyboard mechanism simply lifts out of the machine, leaving the keyboard switches in place. So there's the keyboard mechanical mechanism. And there are the switches back there. So all of the electrical wiring of the Enigma is now exposed for servicing. It's really neat. And uh, if you look closely at these switches, you can see that they're just normal, uh, normally uh, uh, open and normally closed leaf switches that are pushed by the keyboard. And it, servicing involves simply cleaning the contacts. And there's the back of the plug board. And uh, over here, you see the back of the light bulb panel. Very, very simple stuff. Um, if you can fix a flashlight, you can fix an Enigma machine, believe it or not. You think they're very complicated, but they're really incredibly simple. Um, so we take an Enigma, and we take 
I like a diamond spatula. These are really neat little things. They have a little diamond dust on the flat surface there, and you can reach them into the contacts and just sort of scrub those contacts a little bit. I know some people don't like using abrasives on contacts, but uh, the Germans were really dumb and cheap, and instead of using gold, silver, or platinum contacts, they used brass on brass, and that is not as good a connection as you might want. And so I feel that roughing them up a little bit with just a slight amount of abrasion from a diamond spatula works. And uh, I've fixed 50, 60 Enigma machines and haven't had them fail in that respect. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that that works nicely. So you use that on the keyboard contact, you use that on the plug board contact, and um, that is pretty much all you have to do to service a machine put it back together and put it, the case back on it, put it back in the box, and you now have a completely disassembled and reassembled Enigma. If my hands weren't too shaky, I could probably do it for you here, but I think when you come up and look, you'll be able to see everything that you've seen during the disassembly right there. Now, the rotors are very interesting. They have 26 hardwired connections, 26 wires, that connect the input side of the rotor on the right with the output side of the rotor on the left. And they, of course, are random. They're different for each rotor. Rotor three, for instance, has a certain wiring maze. Rotor four has a certain wiring maze and so on. The Enigma was supplied with five rotors, but you can only fit three into the machine at a time. So that was part of the day's key, which rotors you fit in. Disassembling a rotor simply gives you a bunch of rings. The only really important part of the rotor is that wiring. And it's difficult to repair because the uh, contacts on the side of this wheel here uh, are um, brass contacts. And if a wire comes unsoldered over there, you can't just heat up that brass because this is Bakelite. And the moment you heat up the brass, the Bakelite melts and it becomes um, disoriented. So you have to use various techniques to, uh, I've actually drilled and tapped into one of those rather than changing, rather than re-soldering it in order to avoid messing up the Bakelite that holds them all in place. So that's the enigma. And I'll just point out the Dave's key. I mentioned the Dave's key for a code wheel. A equals H, there are only 26 possible days keys in a code wheel. With an Enigma machine, you have 10 to the 114th power different days keys. And what, are, what produces that number? You select three out of the possible five rotors that you're given for the Enigma. There are two extra rotors in a box. You select the three rotor positions on the staff. Is it one, two, three, or one, three, two? whatever the order is, you select the 26 ring settings. Each rotor has a little ring setting that determines when it kicks over the next rotor. It's just like the odometer of a car. You then select 12 jumper cable positions. That is, here are your 12 jumper cables. You put them in different positions on the plug board, and you can use anywhere from no cables up to 12 cables, actually 12, um, 13 cables, and uh, so that number is just incredibly large. And then you select the starting position of each rotor, which means what position it's set at when you look through a little window there. And that ends up with 10 to the 114th power, and the Germans were confident that nobody in the world could possibly guess which of the 10 to the 114th power settings they were using for an enigma for a given day. They had a code book, they circulated it under close guard to every enigma installation, and the people at the enigma installation burned the code book at the end. The code book was good for one month, so if the allies captured a code book, they had all the day's key settings for a whole month. And that was one of the ways that they were able to read the enigmas by capturing code books either from submarines or from other sources. Okay, any questions about the Enigma? Come up and look at it um, afterwards. Yeah? You were talking about getting the wires out of the big light. Maybe you could use an induction heating tool to get the 
but it would still heat the heat the brass, I think, and melt the bakelite. Yeah, it, induction wouldn't wouldn't help me on that one. But it's, thanks for the idea. What I use sometimes is a very very good stainless steel flux, which makes uh, makes it possible to solder at a lower than normal temperature. And I, I use a solder that has a different uh, ratio of tin and lead. I N D I U M. Yeah, what is it? Oh, wow, great! Thank you. Maybe I'll look into that. Can you think you can buy it? I N D I U M. Never heard of it. Great! Thank you. That's neat. Yes, sir. They mess up the whole, and the whole transmission gets messed up. They have to retransmit the information. The receiving station says, hey, you screwed up. I didn't get the message right, and they had to redo it. Uh, the other question you might have is, how did they transmit numbers? There are no numbers on the keyboard. They spelled out the number, eins, zwei, drei, uh, in letters. Did I answer you? Yeah, okay. there's, no, there's no correction. No, no way to cor correct it, no. Yeah, no self-correction. <laughs> right. Okay, now we're going to look at the Fialka. Fialka's fantastic. I don't know how they came up with this thing, but this is a Fialka. And it is just the most unbelievable piece of machinery you could ever imagine. Uh, we're going to take it apart. You see the intact Fialka on the left and the components on the right. The Fialka has a power supply. It's a 24-volt DC power supply, you see on the left and the machine on the right. Uh, and this is, again, the Enigma wiring. And you notice we're, we're talking about 26 wires going in electrical circuit through the, uh, the uh, rotors and back out to the lamp panel. This is the diagram for a Fialka. And here's a keyboard. Now, the Russian alphabet had 30 instead of 26 characters, so that's a little different. But then it goes into a punch card reader, which is located on the side of the Fialka. And we can actually pull it out here. And that thing reads, the, um, uh, reads a punch card, which is the equivalent of the Enigma's plug board panel. And uh, it allows for a tremendous number of possible settings, holes, punch. And then the 30 characters, you'll notice, go into not three, not six, not nine, but 10 coding wheels. So the Fialka has 10 instead of three coding wheels. And to make things even more incredibly beautifully complicated, each of these wheels goes in a different direction. The silly enigma was like the odometer of a car. Right one kicks over, next it over, just like an odometer. With this thing, you got wheels going back, you got wheels going forward, back, forward, back, forward. Just unbelievably complicated. And then there is a reflector at the end, and the 30 characters come back out, and they come down through the keyboard again for the switches on the keyboard. But where do they go? They go to a 5-bit encoder. Like a, tele, like a teletype machine, and a driver, which is just a current driver. And then the driver prints, uh, activates an electric printer, and it is capable of punching holes in paper tape, and it is capable of keying into an external transmitter. So with the Enigma machine, your output was just a light bulb that looked up. You had to write down what light bulb lit up. With this thing, it'll write it down for you on the printer, it'll punch it on a paper tape, and it'll activate an external device. What an incredible piece of machinery this is. Um, just beautiful. When you take a look at it, just appreciate it. There's a little punched paper tape reader on the front and a punch mechanism in the back, and uh, just an amazing machine. So let's take it apart. Here's the power supply on the right, a spare set of rotors in a box, uh, a chad box, which is where the little holes that are punched out of paper tape end up, and the Fialka machine on the left. The Fialka machine is kept in a case like this, 
and you'll notice that there's a little singe mark on the case. Can you see that little brown mark on the top of the case there? Everybody see? <laughs> well, I got a guy in Russia who steals Fialka machines from the depot, and he does it almost legally. He, he is in charge of destroying Fialka machines that don't work. And so he puts them all in a big pile, and he gets a couple of grunts to come over with sledgehammers and bang on them, so there are all these pieces of Fialka around. And then he pours gasoline on this pile of Fialkas, and he lights the gasoline. And then everybody walks off. Okay, they're done in. And he grabs one or two of the Fialkas off the bottom of the pile. Gasoline, the heat only goes up. It doesn't go down. But there's a little singeing usually that goes on. So this was a machine that was down at the bottom of the pile of Fialkas. And it got to me because he loves American dollars. <laughs> and uh, the first one of these that I bought, sort of similar before the Soviet Union broke up, um, I bought it from a guy. I'm very embarrassed about this. Guy came up to me at a table where I was showing enigmas in Germany. He said, "Will you? I see you're interested in enigmas. Would you be interested in a Russian enigma? And I said, there's no such thing as a Russian enigma thinking, you know, big professor me, I know all about enigmas and all that. <laughs> he says, yes, sir, but would you follow me out to my trunk of my car? <laughs> and there in the trunk of his car was unbelievable, a Fialka. And he wanted American dollars, and I wanted the Fialka. And he sold it to me, and he said, would you be interested in an underwater machine gun? <laughs> I said... There's no such thing as an underwater machine gun, my second mistake of the day. And he said, well, I understand, sir, that most machine guns, when you shoot them in the water, the bullet just goes a little ways and it peters out. But these machine guns use depleted uranium darts, and they have a great deal of mass, and they are very effective underwater. And I, I said, well, thank you very much. I learned my lesson, and, and I don't think I want that. <laughs> Can you imagine trying to get an underwater machine gun through uh, inspection at the airport? <laughs> it was bad enough with a Fialka, uh, some kind of old Russian office equipment is what you tell them. Anyway. So Fialkas have an interesting history. When I got the first Fialka home, um, I heard that he had been thrown in jail, the guy who sold it to me. And that got me very scared because the Russians are going to come after me because he's obviously going to give away the name of the guy he sold it to. Uh, and uh, I was really very worried. So I called up a friend at the NSA and I said, I've got this Russian Fialka. He said, you, you have a Fialka? Holy mackerel, we'll trade you an enigma for it. Get it down here. And so that got the Fialka out of my house, which meant the Russians weren't going to come for me. And I got an enigma machine in trade. So, And then when the Soviet Union broke up, there's this guy that, that I told you about who's grabbing machines out of the piles that they're destroying. Anyway, so much for that. The machine itself uh, has a keyboard. This is one type of keyboard. There's a Polish machine. And uh, this is another type of um, Fialka with a slightly different keyboard. And this is the one we have here with n different characters. Um, there are uh, Russian characters and um, um, other characters. <laughs> and and it's, it's a really neat machine. So let's just take a look at it closely. We see the, we see the 10 rotors right there, and they can be removed. You just move the reflector over here away, and you can lift out this group of 10 um, of, the, of the rotors. And uh, the keyboard has all kinds of different characters depending on who is using it. In front here, you see the paper tape reader, which allows it to read in a pre-programmed message so you don't even have to type on the screen. And a little counter up here that keeps track of the characters. There's a printer mechanism using old uh, uh, typewriter reels and uh, a circulating print wheel, sort of like an IBM Selectric, if you remember those guys. And also that mechanism is also a tape punch. Um, on the left side, we see where the plug board is set. And you pull out that little thing that I showed you there, and you plop a punch card on top of that. 
and that is the equivalent of putting different jumper wires in the plug board of an Enigma, but it's uh, done with punched holes. This is the bottom of the thing, very, very heavy casting, and uh, this is the back of the Fialca, and um, we can start our disassembly of the Fialca by taking out the motor. That's the easiest thing to get out there, just four screws and a connector that hold the motor system in. So we've taken the motor from here out over to there. Uh, then we take the keyboard off, and again, there are just a few screws. Um, that you can see the holes for them there and there and there. Take those out, and it just lifts out, and the plug over here, a plug assembly, the keyboard can be replaced. That's nice thing about, another nice thing about the Fialca is that the modular components can be swapped in and out rather than the Enigma where you'd have to do a, an incredible desoldering job to swap an entire keyboard. Um, here's the rotor basket, so to speak, and the mechanism here. These mechanisms make, make it so the one wheel turns toward the back and the other wheel turns the, toward the fo uh, forward with every letter that you encipher. So the wheels turn in an, in an odd manner. Um, you, when you take those mechanisms off, you have this cast base, and that's the printer punch up there and the rotor basket down below. Here we see the printer punch over here, the motor here, and the base down there. And this is the printer punch. The printer punch itself is an absolutely amazing device. This little hammer hits that little pin and punches holes in the paper tape, which goes along here, while at the same time, the same paper tape is being printed by this rotating print wheel and some typewriter ribbon. And the other thing is this is a, a lifter this um, device that you see here is capable of lifting the print wheel up and down to select different groups of characters on the print wheel. Very amazing machine. So there it is, all of the parts taken apart. And uh, I'll just give you a look inside. The wiring is magnificent. This is the bottom of the, um, of the punch of the card reader. Um, we're getting a little closer to the card reader. We've taken that bottom off. We have more contact, and there's the card reader itself. And um, the wiring is beautifully done. Every single wire, it looks like the, I don't know why they do this, but they may have inspected every one of these to see that it is not a cold solder joint, perhaps. Um, again, another view. This very complicated machine but um, very interesting. And the rotors have, um, the, this is the reflector actually, you can see the connections on the reflector, and again the connections on the reflector, and another set of diodes at the other end of the rotor assembly. This is the power supply, very simple power supply, um, just a brute force large transformer, and a filter network. Uh, it'll take 110 to um, 100 volts to 250 volts, and it'll give you always 24 volt output. Uh, the basic uh, power supply is just a full wave rectifier with a capacitor across it. Doesn't have to be real smooth DC, and that's 24 volts to run the mechanism. Take a look at the rotors themselves. They are also works of extraordinary engineering talent. That's a stack of rotors, 10 rotors, and they're held in place with a little clip at the end there. Each of the rotors is amazing. I have them up here for you to look at. Um, and uh, the neat thing about these rotors, you remember that with an Enigma machine, the wiring inside the rotor was the wiring inside the rotor. It was hardwired in there. With the Fialca, the rotors are actually set up in such a way that you can take a rotor, and here is a typical Fialca rotor, and you can take the wiring, the entire wiring for the rotor out, and put it back in in any one of 30 different positions, or you can turn it over like that and put it back in for any one of 30 more positions. So this one rotor is the equivalent of 60, 60 Enigma rotors. Just 
absolutely incredible. We'll take a look at that. You take this retaining clip off, and you can then lift out the rotor maze and put it back in, uh, in any of these possible positions. And the different sides of the rotor maze are um, indicated with a number. And I do have a bunch of these for sale, actually. I bought so many that I can sell them. And I'm going to put them out on my table tomorrow. But if you always wanted a Fialca rotor, uh, instead of the 100 bucks they're getting on eBay, you can get one for 40 bucks from me. And the other thing I have for sale, which is kind of funny, I managed to buy about 200 of these Fialca oil cans. And they are actually the oil cans that were supplied in the kit, the service kit for Fialca. So if you want to oil your stuff, <laughs> you could have a an oil can from a Fialca for five bucks. Anyway, there's the service kit for the Fialca, and this is, strangely enough, this is some kind of a medal, a Russian medal that uh, was made to commemorate or uh, recognize the Fialca. And if you look at this side of the Fialca, this medal has a complete Fialca rotor, just as we saw in it, and the, this side, Sovietska Dobrentsia, I don't know what it's saying, but it's definitely related to Fialkas. Okay, so the days key for a Fialka uh, are very complicated. You select a set of 10 rotors. There are a number of different sets that you can actually get. Select 10 rotor positions on the shaft, so you can move them around the shaft. Select two internal wiring maze orientations, we saw that giving you 60 possible combinations. Uh, that's the 30 internal wiring maze settings. You select the pin locations for each rotor, uh, and that is um, each of the rotors has a little pin that tells when it kicks over the next rotor in line. You select a punch card for the thing. You select a starting position of each rotor, and I don't really know how many days keys there could be for this machine. The NSA will not reveal that information. And I'm guessing it's got to be pretty close to 10 to the thousandth power, given the incredible complexity when compared with the Enigma. So when we move on to the American M209, M209 is a nice little device. It is portable and it is totally non-electrical. So it's a purely mechanical device and uh, it comes with a carrying case, a small carrying case. Uh, it comes with a manual, and it comes with a roll of tape inside it. And uh, here is an M209. I don't know why this guy must have read a, a really exciting message or something. He's got quite an expression on his face. But you'll notice the M209 actually has a little cutout where it fits on your knee. And it can be strapped to your knee uh, for operation. And uh, here's a large bunch of M209s that you can see down in the bottom there being used in a military installation. The M209 has a number of parts that we're going to look at, but remember that there's a roll of paper tape up there. The tape is sticky tape, and when letters are printed on it, it can then be ripped off and put onto a message form. So it prints out. Unlike the Enigma, where you have to write down the light, light bulb settings, uh, the um, M209 prints out the messages the way a Fialca does. The um, uh, machine input is this wheel. So every letter that you want to encipher, you simply bring that letter up to the index mark. And you'll notice that this has the letter A across from the index mark. And from a user standpoint, all you have to do is make sure that this little control over here is in the cipher position. That means it's going to take the letter A and make it into a coded version, in our example, H. If you flip this over, the other setting is D for decipher. And in that case, you would set this at H, and you would get back your original letter A. So this is how you input information into this device. The cipher and decipher switch is over there. And the printout that it gives you uh, is on a piece of paper tape. 
in the paper tape can be, as I've said, glued to a message form. And uh, this is the print wheel assembly you can see here. And it has a little roller, which is difficult to see down in here, which uh, is uh, dipped in ink. So that is the inking mechanism. And part of the little toolkit in the top is an inking device, which allows you to soak that roller in ink so you don't run out of ink. The um, uh, internal workings, it has also a character counter up here. And the internal workings are really beautifully complex. If you look at it, over here is your input wheel and your printed out either enciphered or deciphered text. Um, the machine uh, has a number of features I'm going to try and highlight. These are the rotors. And the rotors, you'll notice, are peculiar in that they have a different number of letters on each rotor. The most densely populated of the rotors is the one on the left with uh, 26 letters. And then as you go over to the right, there are less and less letters on the roller. So that's part of the confusion in trying to decipher the machine. The rotors themselves have little pins that you can push to the left or pull, push out to the right. And this one's pushed into the left. This one's sticking out towards you. And those pins activate the mechanism. Here we see them in the rotor, which is in place here. Um, this pin is pushed out to the left, and this pin is pushed out to the right. And they affect the adjacent rotors. The coding and decoding mechanisms uh, produce the printout on the tape. And then to activate the entire machine, you just turn a big black handle that you see on the left side of the machine, and that runs it through all of the steps. We can look at that later. To push the pins through, you use a little tiny screwdriver. So that's part of the day's key setting that we've been talking about. The other strange thing about this machine is what they call a basket. Uh, it is 27 horizontal rods here, numbered 1 through 27. And you can slide these little metal things back and forth on the metal rod using a special notch screwdriver. Or you can do it with your finger just as easily. And those mechanisms then contact the, other, the rest of the mechanism. And uh, it, it's part of the enciphering process. So a very neat machine, very simple. Um, I don't know how many days keys there are, but the settings are pretty straightforward. You set the pin settings for each of the six rotors. You set the 22, it's actually 27 basket pin settings, and you select the starting position of each rotor, and that gives you the day's key. And it's got to be a lot smaller than the Enigma. And finally, we have the Harris, uh, which is the latest in enciphered handy talkies. These devices are, you know, what, three or four thousand bucks, Mike, do you think? Somewhere around there. Um, I picked up one at a uh, reenactment. A guy on a, on a Sherman tank saw my stand and he said, I see you have uh, some World War II walkie-talkies. You want to trade this for one of those? I said, yes, yes, yes. And so I got one of these things. He didn't know what it was, but the Harris has the equivalent of an Enigma machine and this little enciphering device on the back. So that's what people are using these days to replace all of this mechanical stuff that I've been showing you. Um, and that's pretty much what I have for you today, but be happy to answer any questions. I think we've got used about an hour. Anybody have questions about anything? Yeah. Yeah, it, yes, it does. It produced. Yes, 
Thank you. Thank you. That's great. So it's fairly secure, I imagine. Very secure. Yeah. You can't even export. You can only export. I'll remember that not to take it to Europe with me. <laughs> Michael. Yes, you can. Yeah, the four rotor I should have mentioned. Um, one person in the German military got a little nervous about the possibility that the Enigma was being deciphered by the Allies. Um, during that, he was in head of all the submarines, and he saw the submarines were being sunk at a, an alarming rate. So he ordered that another rotor be added to an Enigma machine, and they couldn't just rebuild the entire Enigma. So they took a regular Enigma, three rotor Enigma like this, shortened up the reflector at the end and sneaked another rotor in there. And it became a four rotor marine, submarine Enigma. And uh, the neat thing was he got into a pissing contest with the head of the Air Force, Goering Ger Goebbels, uh, who said, no, no, you can't have um, an Enigma machine that we can't read on our Enigma machine, um, and you, you've got to make it compatible with our machine. So it turned out that the four-rotor Enigma machine, if you set the leftmost rotor at the letter A, it becomes electrically identical to a three-rotor Enigma machine, and the leftmost rotor doesn't rotate at all. So. That was the concession. That, of course, made it incredibly easier for the Allies to crack the code. Other questions? Anybody? Cracking the code, do you know that the Polish mathematician, three Polish mathematicians were the first to crack the Enigma code way back six years before the beginning of World War II. And they were successfully reading Enigma, Enigma coded messages six years before the British had anything to do with decoding. So the movie, you may have seen the movie Imitation Game, uh, is a lie, basically, because Alan Turing didn't figure out a way to crack the code. The Polish mathematicians did. The good thing about that movie is that they used my enigma in the movie. And so the picture of Alan Turing going, Heil Hitler, and typing on the machine is always fun for me. But uh, that was um, the underlying. And I actually dedicated the, my book on the Enigma, which is called Inside Enigma, to the three Polish mathematicians. And uh, there are pictures of them in the front of the book. Anything else? Did the machine speed up the process of the math? Was that what Turing did? Did he sped up the math? He, he did, uh, and the, the other things that he did was that the Germans gradually um, evolved better techniques for using the Enigma. The Poles had relied upon searching for um, expected words in the text, like Hitler, uh, or like the fact that every time a transmission, Enigma transmission was made by a particular radio station, uh, they would always start with their call letters or with the date or with the time or something like that. Those were useful techniques that the Poles used in cracking the Enigma. And then as the Germans became more sophisticated, um, Alan Turing developed machines that would deal with the sophistication. And he built machines, as you said, that are much faster, uh, powered, electrically powered devices to decode the Enigma machines. Anybody, yeah. Yeah, and the motor drives the print mechanism, it drives the wheels, it drives... Um, I'm, I might try and hook it up tomorrow and have it running, but uh, you can see all the things that it drives, the pump, pump, paper tape punch and all. Feel free to come up and poke around with them, yeah. I don't know. Error free. <laughs> You're saying, does it have error correction? The, say again. Maybe a corroded battery or you to service it yet. I guess that could happen. <laughs> you, you, you're saying possible? Yeah, take it apart and fix it, maybe the battery, tag somebody to contact or something. 
I haven't had the guts to take it apart yet, I have to admit. I think about everything, but I haven't fiddled with this guy yet. <laughs> I consider him lucky to have one. The, um, if you go on eBay and you look up Harris um, Falcon radio, you'll find that you can buy this radio for about $300. And it turns out that the Chinese are making an exact visual copy of it, which is just a two meter HT in this case, sort of like a bale thing inside this case. And they're selling them for 200 bucks. It's really, come up and uh, feel it. It's not, not the kind of HT you want to carry around. It's, it's really quite heavy. But uh, I guess they're selling a lot of them. I, people told me that they bought them. <laughs> Anybody else? Come up and play, and uh, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All good? Oh, all good. Yeah. How late did the rain hang in? Oh, I don't know, around 